All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, happy to be here again doing uh, Aircraft Systems 2. I thought that what I would like to do is maybe discuss a little bit more detail of uh, some of the items that we discussed the other night. Uh, let me see what I've got going on here. Yeah, that happens. Yeah, it's just like a recursive thing. If you just switch to one of your other tabs, you'll be fine. Let's do that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> is that better? Perfect. Uh, much better. Much better. Good. I'm getting a little echo, but that's not bad. Okay. So, anyway, we talked a little bit the other night about um, how reciprocation engines work, and I thought uh, it'd be good to show a graphic. And I finally found one that I think is very good. And this is actually um, an interesting little. I seem to have lost the audio, guys. Is that me or Mark? Can you? Uh... I muted you, Mark, uh, so I can't hear you. But I think I George, you might have lost your audio. I lost George too. The turn. So you have at any one time. Hey, one George. Cylinder, here. Yes. I'm sorry, you broke up for a while there, but it sounds like I think you're back. Could you could you start again? Sorry. Oh, um, what this shows is a graphic representation of a cylinder in the engine, as if you in the uh, the confines of the engine, the, the cylinder being transparent. Um, what this is useful for is seeing what each cylinder is doing at each moment of the four cycles. Now, I've frozen it right here. So what you can see basically is, um, in this case, uh, and I'll just call this cylinder one, this two, this three, and this four. Uh, cylinder one here has the fuel-air mixture in it, and it will begin on the upstroke of the cylinder to begin compressing it. This one has just fired and will be going down. As this one, which is paired with it, goes down, it will be drawing uh, fuel-air mixture into it. And as this one goes up, it will be exhausting the, uh, the burned gases. So at any one time, you have uh, one cylinder firing. And as it goes down, the, another cylinder, not necessarily the one next to it, but another cylinder, is also on the downstroke. And it is... Uh, drawing intake air in. The other two are going in the other direction. One to um, compress the fuel air mixture, the other to exhaust the burn mixture. So as you'll notice, it, the aircraft will, will, well, the engine will uh, alternate between different cylinders. And the order, the firing order, is determined by the configuration of the engine, the number of cylinders, whether it's uh, in line or horizontally opposed, um, and the particular manufacturer. For example, the way the cylinders are numbered between um, Lycoming and Continental are different. I don't recall which one it is, but one numbers them from front to back, the other from back to front, meaning firewall forward or prop backwards uh, in terms of what the numbers are. They would be one, three, two, four, or one, three, two, four. That's not the order that they fire in necessarily. They're just given the numbers for, for use in terms of determining which cylinder you're talking about. But what you'll have is the firing order is determined by what position the, uh, the piston is in its orientation on the crankshaft. So this is the crankshaft right here. In this case, it's driving a belt, but it could be as in most general aviation aircraft, directly connected to the prop. The prop is actually bolted uh, to a flange at the forward end of the crankshaft. So as the crankshaft turns, it turns the prop at the same RPM that the engine is turning. Uh, there are 
certain types of aircraft that have a gearing system or a prop speed reduction unit, which is a little more complex uh, set of gearing. Um, for example, um, uh, King Airs, which use a turbo prop, a turbine engine, jet turbine engine, have the uh, the, R the engine RPM geared down significantly to get it to about 1,800 RPM at the prop, but the engine's turning it considerably faster. So there's a considerably um, complex uh, gearing mechanism to gear the prop down, but most uh, aircraft engines are, are bolted directly to the uh, crankshaft. So engine turns at 2,300 RPM, the prop is turning at 2,300 RPM. So in this case, just kind of ignore the belt. You can, uh, in this case, the belt is turning the camshafts uh, this is a double overhead cam because you've got one, two, and what the cams do is time the valves here and here for each piston intake and exhaust uh, to move up and down as they need to be in the cycle of allowing fuel air mixture in or exhaust gases out. So in this case, if you notice uh, each one of the cylinders is at some point in the four cycles and they're all different. So if we watch it a little bit, you'll see that the firing order is changing from, in this case, let's see, I'll call it one, three, four, two. One, three, four, two. So they're not firing in the necessarily the order of the number of the cylinders. They're firing in the order of how the engine is designed to generate power onto the crankshaft. Now, if you'll notice that the crankshaft is, there's a, the shaft is basically in line with the prop. I'm calling this the prop over here. So the crankshaft is right here, but the uh, to get the shaft to turn, the pistons have to be connected to it off center. Uh, these are connecting rods, which connect the piston right here to the crankshaft. These are called journals, and they're offset um, uh, items that the, uh, the connecting rod will be attached to. Uh, so when the piston drives down, it pushes the connecting rod against the journal, which causes this to, if you just, let's say, focus on this one right here. Notice how it will reciprocate. It will go back and forth. The piston will go up and down, and the crankshaft will go around. So basically what a reciprocating engine does is it converts linear motion up and down to the piston to rotational motion, which is the turning of the prop which is basically the function of a reciprocating engine. So if you watch this one, you notice how it is turning as the, whoops, let me try that again. See if we can restart that. All right. All right, I think I broke the internet. Give me a moment here as it reloads. Okay, here we go. So if you notice as the, uh, uh, piston is going up and down, it's, it's rotating around. That's this uh, reciprocating action that drives the crankshaft in a circular motion. So and if you also notice, you can sort of see a little bit of these valves opening up as the lobes on the camshaft, which are oblong. As they rotate, they will push the valves down to open them and allow them to close. So what the valves do is allow the fuel air mixture in and the burned exhaust gases out. Now, the timing of when the valves open and close is again structured by the designer. Now, you'll hear the term sometimes, um, uh, and you, you don't really need to know the, the entire engineering of how the aircraft is set, but you hear before top dead center or after top dead center. All that means is the, uh, the firing actually occurs before the piston gets to the top of its travel. It's actually firing while it's still compressing. And as it completely burns, it's driving down the other direction. Uh, so the valves will open at different times to allow air in and uh, exhaust gases out. What was interesting to me when I first learned this is that uh, sometimes the valves are both open, sometimes they're both closed. Sometimes one is open and sometimes the other is open. Uh, so there are times when both are open and fuel air mixture is coming in and exhaust gas is going out and the incoming mixture is helping scavenger clean the, uh, the piston out, the, uh, the cylinder out. So uh, 
valve timing is what mechanics do to set to make sure that the engine is functioning properly. Now, uh, sometimes you'll hear in your car, uh, particularly older cars, you'll hear uh, a ticking sound, which is not detonation or knocking, but it's a, it's a su more subtle ticking. Uh, it's, it's called a valve knock or valve clicking. Uh, and what that is is the, uh, in most uh, av general aviation engines, the valves are what are called, uh, they're run on hydraulic lifters. That is, there's a, an amount of oil pressure that holds the, uh, the valve um, open, and then the, uh, the camshaft will drive it closed and then allow it to open up, or they can be spring-loaded. If those springs wear out, or if the hydraulic lifters start to leak, sometimes the valves will not open and close at the appropriate times. You'll get incomplete burning. You'll get uh, reduced power. Um, so when you talk to a mechanic, if you're having difficulties with uh, your engine, let's say it's a rental engine or it's your own aircraft engine, um, being able to describe uh, when you have problems, what regime of the flight are you in? Are you, are you noticing problems on climb or when the engine's at idle or when you're running at full power or in cruise speed? Uh, what is the RPM? Uh, what was your mixture setting? If you can give the mechanic uh, this kind of information, that helps them to diagnose what the problem is. Is it a valve problem? Is it uh, possibly uh, the rings are worn and you're getting uh, an incomplete seal? Are the spark plugs um, uh, fouled? Um, so there are any number of things that could be a cause of loss of power that the mechanic can diagnose depending on the symptoms. It's very much like a doctor. If you can describe the symptoms, uh, when does it hurt? Well, when you when you move your arm, where does it hurt? And okay, that kind of thing. So, uh, so knowing a little bit about how the engine works, as uh, like so, you're not going to be a mechanic facing it yourself, but you can you can describe to a mechanic uh, anytime you have a problem, you think the engine is not producing full power. Um, so, I want to take a moment and look here at uh, we talked a little bit about yesterday about um, carburetors, uh, since most of uh, training aircraft have carburation instead of um, uh, fuel injection. So we'll look at a little carburation video here. And this is actually a very simplified view, but it's very good because it shows some aspects of what a carbur what most carburetors look like. This is um, an updraft carburetor. So it's bolted onto the engine at the top of the carburetor. Uh, air is drawn in through the intake and up through the carburetor. They can be downdraft, but most of these are bolted onto the bottom of the engine. So they'd be updraft carburetors. Fuel uh, is drawn either by gravity, say from a high-winged aircraft like a Cessna Skyhawk or 152, gravity, assisted by a pump if necessary, will uh, put fuel into the bowl of the carburetor or the float chamber. There's a float in there uh, which allows, which keeps the uh, fuel at a certain level. Um, if you're in a low-wing aircraft, uh, the fuel tank is typically at the level or below uh, the carburetor. So obviously if fuel doesn't flow uphill, it has to get there uh, under pressure of a, um, an engine driven or electric fuel pump. So here we, what we've got here is uh, to give you just a quick overview of what the parts are and how this will relate to carburetor icing, which is a, a problem that's endemic to, uh, to float carburetors, is fuel is drawn in to this float chamber which controls the level, which as you'll notice is about the same level here. This is called uh, this is, well, I'll let, let it run, you can see. This is the venturi of the carburetor. Uh, so air comes in and the discharge nozzle here is where fuel is uh, squirted basically into the airstream that will then go into, air will come out of the carburetor into the intake manifold and it will be split into four or six or however many uh, cylinders uh, are being fed with the fuel-air mixture. So you have fuel coming into the float chamber. The float controls the level of the fuel. The fuel will come into this discharge nozzle. Air will enter through here. Now, you notice the shape of this, which is a, uh, which as you might notice, looks something like an airfoil. Uh, it's called a venturi, and just like an airfoil, it creates an area of low pressure because the air flowing through here. Uh, if you remember Bernoulli's principle from uh, your study of airframe and aerodynamics, if you've gotten to those lessons yet, what makes a wing lift is the 
air going over the curved surface on the top of the wing has to travel faster. And when you increase the flow of a fluid, whether it's liquid or air, you reduce the pressure. So what happens is when the air flows into this venturi, by flowing through the constriction, it speeds up. When it speeds up, the pressure drops. When the pressure drops, that essentially creates a pressure differential from the ambient to that in the engine. So there's a, the air will want to go this way, and it will take this fuel into the intake manifold. Now the fuel is basically squirted out of this into little droplets where, and it's vaporized. So it becomes a vapor, not a liquid. So the vapor will combine with the air coming in through the um, air intake of the, of the engine. It will mix here. And this little flapper here, this, but, this is a butterfly valve. This is controlled by the throttle. Um, when it's mostly vertical, the throttle is wide open. When it is closed or more uh, horizontal, that's when the engine's at idle and less air is getting around it. See if I can run it forward a little bit and you can see how that, that opens and closes. When it's um, open, you get more air flow through, therefore more power. When it closes, you get more, um, you get less air going through and therefore it's at idle. Now, uh, the question becomes, well, how does carburetor icing occur, particularly uh, in the summertime, uh, you can actually get carburetor icing at temperatures over 90 degrees ambient, which astonishes most people because you think, well, uh, water freezes at 32 degrees, so why, is, why am I getting ice on a summer day? Well, what happens is when you have uh, this venturi here decreasing the pressure, it also decreases the temperature. And when liquid fuel is sprayed into this throat here, and you have the uh, uh, lower pressure and lower temperature, and it's vaporized, uh, the air temperature in this throat here can drop as much as 70 degrees. Uh, because when you uh, evaporate fuel, it sheds heat, so it becomes colder. So what happens is, uh, when the air is cooling and speeding up, and you inject this uh, vapor into it, and it evaporates, uh, that loss of temperature can be significant enough to cause uh, carburetor icing or start frost to form. And if I'll run it forward a little bit, you'll see a little bit about how it'll start to form. Uh, it'll start to build up on the walls of the venturi here in the throat because that's constricted. It'll also start to build up on the plates of the uh, butterfly valve, and particularly when it's closed or near idle. Let's see here. It should start here. So here's what it'll look like. It'll start to build here in the throat, and it'll start to build up on the uh, the butterfly valve. So if you think about that, now you've got reduced space. You've got even more reduced airflow. Therefore, you've got even less power. And if you have less power, then of course it's going to get worse and worse. Now the way this to stop or reverse this is this. Um, you get some heating uh, just from contact with the engine, but not enough to melt this ice. So what happens is uh, heat can be directed to the carburetor through the use of carburetor ice, carburetor heat. And what that does, when you pull the carburetor heat knob out, it directs airflow from a muff or a container around the um, uh, exhaust pipe, which, is, which also serves to heat the aircraft, uh, which is where you get your heat if in, the, in the wintertime. Uh, even if you fly in the summertime, uh, you fly high enough, uh, it's going to get pretty chilly in the uh, aircraft. That's why small aircraft don't have air conditioning, but they do have heat. Uh, so the same heating system that will heat the, uh, the uh, interior of the aircraft will also heat around, there's a box around this uh, carburetor, which will heat it up. And it, uh, it's a very efficient uh, method of heating. You'll actually uh, heat this fairly quickly, melt this ice, uh, if there's enough ice in here and it melts to water, uh, that slug of water can actually get into the engine and cause it to stumble a little bit. But once that's clear, you should be able to um, have full power again. So anyway, this is this is what carburetor icing looks like, uh, and it can come on very quickly and it can dissipate very quickly as well. So for uh, those who fly. Um, 
carbureted engines. That's something you always have to be uh, aware of and uh, uh, careful of, even in the summertime. So uh, the key is to follow the manufacturer's, the pilot's operating handbook, uh, the manufacturer's recommendations for when you should and should not use carburetor heat. You typically don't use it on takeoff because when you heat air, it of course becomes uh, less dense. And if you have less dense air, you're going to reduce the amount of power that the engine will output. So uh, typically carburetor heat is not used on takeoff. Uh, however, on landing, since the uh, engine is often at idle and you have the risk of developing uh, carburetor icing in these areas, uh, most aircraft uh, manufacturers such as Cessna, if I, I've, I've flown Skyhawks fairly regularly and I believe that the uh, carburetor heat is a checklist item for uh, before landing. So anyway, anybody have any questions about um, uh, carburetor icing or how that occurs? Can you explain very quickly one more time exactly why it is that the air cools? Is it simply just the, the introduction of vapor that somehow removes the heat from the air? No, it's both. Uh, it's basically, it's a matter of physics. Um, if you've ever uh, done any kind of uh, uh, work with, uh, say, air compressors, when you compress air into a cylinder, it, uh, it'll get warm because you compress, you're, you're pushing the molecules closer together. When you release the air, uh, like if you have a uh, an air nozzle on the end of your home air compressor, if you ever you know squirt the air on your skin, it feels very cold. Because what happens is uh, it's just a matter of physics. When a gas goes from a higher pressure to a lower pressure, it gives up heat. It becomes cooler. So that is just that's just uh, physics. It has nothing to do with uh, airplanes in particular or engines in particular. It's just um, it's uh, physics 101. It's one of those things that uh, higher pressure air is hotter, uh, lower pressure air, or as it as it lowers in pressure, it gets cooler. Now you add to that the evaporation of the liquid, and when a liquid evaporates, what it's doing is it's changing its its state from a liquid to a vapor. Or think about this: when um, when ice melts. Uh, it's basically uh, giving up what heat it has into uh, the environment. So whenever it changes state, uh, you know, for example, when, when a liquid evaporates, it's going to uh, become less dense, and therefore it's going to become cooler. Uh, mainly, if you it's, it's at a molecular level, as the molecules are farther and farther apart because they're not as dense, because the pressure's lower. Uh, they're not banging around as much, and they're not generating as much internal friction and heat. So it's, it's two things. It's the reduction of pressure of the airflow through the throat of the um, carburetor and the evaporation of the fluid, which is the fuel, when it becomes vaporized going into uh, the airflow here. So it's both of them really contribute to that. And if you have ambient conditions, which are cooler than normal, then you're just getting that much closer to the conditions that will allow carburetor icing to occur. Yeah, I guess it just surprises me that the density decreases when you add vapor. I would think that the density would increase. Well, well, the density uh, is, I'm speaking of these two as two separate things. The density decreases because of the speeding up of the airflow. Yeah. The, va the vaporization of the fuel is a separate thing. Yeah. It, the density will will increase slightly because you're putting something in it, which is the um, the vapor. But the temperature drop for the vapor and the temperature drop for the increase of the airflow is considerably more than the increase in temperature you get because you're slightly making the uh, the airflow denser by injecting something into it. Uh, the amount of uh, density that's increased by putting a little bit of vapor into it uh, is more than overcome by the drop in temperature because of the uh, decrease in pressure and the evaporation of the uh, fuel. So does that mean that carburetor icing is at higher risk when the air is moving faster and therefore when the throttle is wide open? Uh, it's, that's the biggest pressure well, difference. Well, well, it's not so much a faster. What it is is the... Um, the speed is determined, the speed of the airflow through the engine is determined by the shape and the size of the throat of the churi. The amount of the air that gets through 
is, is uh, determined by the, the throttle plate here. So it's going to go through at the same speed, it's just not as much as going to go through. So, so the design of this, uh, it's like the design of a wing determines uh, how much air goes over the top or below it and, and how fast the air goes over the top or below it because of the shape of the airfoil. That's a fixed thing. The airfoil is what it is. This is like two air, this, in a way, if you think about it, this is like um, old-timey biplanes that had constriction between the two wings before they figured out that it actually was okay. better to put the curve on the top. of This is, this is like two wings right here. So, okay. So, okay, so the speed doesn't change. So basically, as you adjust the throttle, the air intake. Also right. It it, it, it it determines the volume the volume of the air that goes into the in the induction system. Uh, gotcha. Right. The induction system, which comes right out of here. So basically, the volume of the fuel air mixture and the the quantity of the fuel air mixture is determined by this is this right here is basically is connected to the mixture control. It determines how much fuel gets into this. Um, nozzle. Uh, or, so the amount of fuel that goes into the airstream is controlled by the mixture. Uh, if you pull the mixture uh, all the way out and or push it, whichever, however, however this is connected, uh, but if you maximize the amount of fuel going into the airflow, you have the maximum richness. If you restrict this amount of fluid or fuel going in here, you'll get a leaner mixture. So the Air comes through here and the fuel is added to it and the ratio between the two is controlled not by the air because the air comes in at the rate that the air comes in. It's the amount of fuel you add to it. That's why your mixture control controls fuel. Your throttle controls how much of that mix actually gets into the engine. Less gets in, it's going to produce less power. If more gets in, it will produce more power. So, so that's the basics of carburetor icing. Now, one other uh, fact that carburetors have uh, a problem with it. You know, uh, most people have never seen this because they haven't driven a carbureted car unless you drive an old vintage car or a muscle car, uh, is vapor lock. And what vapor lock is, is if you have, uh, if the engine gets hot enough, uh, and particularly the, um, the carburetor itself, uh, the fuel can actually get so hot that it will start to evaporate before it gets into the fuel nozzle. And if you get a bubble uh, in the line, it can essentially um, uh, cause, cause the fuel flow to stop. So basically what that is is uh, um, a blockage in the fuel line. I actually had this experience once when I was uh, uh, driving a 69 Firebird. It was a, an old muscle car. Uh, with the carburetor, and it was a hot summer day in Georgia, approaching 100 degrees, and I stopped to pick up the mail, and when I came back out and started the car, it wouldn't start, and it turned over, and it would run. It would it would just attempt to start, but it wouldn't start. It wouldn't catch, and I couldn't figure out what the problem was until I smelled the quantity of unburned fuel that was floating around the car, and then it suddenly dawned on me. I have vapor lock. So I opened the hood, let it let the engine cool down for about five minutes, and it started right back up again. So, so vapor lock is something that uh, you don't see in uh, uh, it can happen in injected systems that, that's rare because you you have a closed system and you're not uh, quite as susceptible to that. But, um, but anyway, the, the main thing with carburetors is is that you always have to be aware of carburetor icing, uh, even in the summertime. Uh, it's just something to to be aware of and first start noticing it to to address it immediately because if you let it go too much and it it essentially chokes the engine off you might not be able to start the engine because once that ice is formed you have no way to heat it because when the engine stops running the uh, the exhaust is not going through it so you don't have any way to heat the carburetor melt the ice so you're essentially at a, a catch-22 so you get when you if you start to notice the engine starting to stumble or cough a little bit immediately apply the uh, carburetor heat and see if that doesn't uh, address the problem. So anyway, all right, uh, I'd like to move on a little bit. I talked to some a, a little bit the other day about variable pitch props uh, or what are known as constant speed propellers. Uh, this uh, is a pretty good little graphic that, uh, well, come on, open up. There we go. So you can see it a little better. So basically what we have here is the throttle 
the prop control or the RPM control and the mixture. And in most aircraft, this is the configuration you will see. Prop on the left, round black knob. Uh, excuse me, throttle on the left, round black knob. Uh, prop control in the center, um, a blue, somewhat wavy, uh, like star-shaped uh, knob. And then the mixture control on the right, a red um, neural type knob. So you can feel the difference and see the difference in color, and they also have the same position. You might find some very old uh, aircraft like Beechcraft that had this, uh, I think before some of the early Bonanzas had these backwards. The, the mixture was here, the, or the, the mixture and the prop were, were swapped. But this is the standard configuration that you would see from left to right. Now, on uh, high performance or complex aircraft, uh, that have complex aircraft that have a controllable pitch prop, you will have two engine indicators, an RPM gauge and a manifold pressure gauge. And I'll explain what the purpose of that is in a moment. In uh, aircraft that do not have a controllable pitch prop, you will generally not see the manifold pressure, only the RPM. Uh, let's say it would we'll take a, one, a Cessna 152 as an example. Uh, throttle will control the speed of the engine, fast or slow, and that will be measured by the RPM. And what you see on the RPM is typically the prop speed as well as the engine speed, because in most aircraft, the prop is bolted directly in a flange to the crankshaft. In an aircraft that has a controllable pitch prop or a variable pitch, controllable pitch, uh, constant speed, all those terms are used sort of interchangeably. And the reason uh, constant speed is used is because what happens is when you set a constant speed prop at a particular RPM, it will change the blade angle to maintain that RPM for a given manifold pressure setting. In other words, it makes minute adjustments as the uh, load on the prop uh, changes through aerodynamic, uh, just the, the flight forces. So once you set the uh, RPM with the prop, it's going to stay there and the, uh, the blade angle will change this is considered fine pitch or, or high pitch, and low pitch would be uh, much more angular or close to vertical. Um, so anyway, on takeoff, you typically want fine pitch or this high pitch because you want the engine to make the most RPM it can for its given throttle setting. So on takeoff, you will uh, have the prop and the mixture typically in full forward position, full rich, full prop. As you advance the throttle, the manifold pressure gauge will rise, as will the RPM, to its uh, max setting. Uh, manifold pressure is the pressure inside the intake manifold just before the intake valve into the cylinder. Uh, the pressure at that point is measured, and it's referred to as MAP, or manifold absolute pressure. You'll sometimes see MAP gauge or manifold pressure gauge. That's the pressure just before the air goes into the, uh, through the intake valve into the cylinder. Uh, this is measured in inches of mercury. Uh, depending on the size of the engine or the type of the engine, uh, most uh, four or six cylinder aircraft engines, a Skyhawk, a Mooney, a Bonanza, you're gonna see something between 25 and maybe somewhat less than 30 inches of mercury on the manifold pressure. Some large uh, radial engines like Pratt & Whitney can be considerably higher than that, but you won't typically see that on a general aviation aircraft. Um, you typically also will see an RPM red line somewhere around the 25, 2600 RPM area. Uh, most general aviation propellers, um, if you start getting much beyond 2,700 RPM, the speed of the tip of the prop uh, will approach the speed of sound. And if it becomes uh, supersonic at the prop tip, it's very loud and it becomes uh, much less efficient as an airfoil. So aircraft are typically designed so that the, the prop will not go supersonic at normal operating speeds. Now, if you think about a prop uh, 
like a merry-go-round, if you remember that from your childhood days. Uh, if you're on a merry-go-round, if you're in the center, you're turning around very slowly. But if your friend is at the edge, he's turning around very fast to go around the same number of times you are. So the farther away you are from the hub to the tip, the faster that tip is going to be moving. So the longer the prop, the faster the tip speed. So typically most uh, general aviation aircraft are set somewhere in the 25, 26, 2700 RPM range as a red line. You don't want to exceed that. Now, one thing about operating uh, an aircraft with uh, a constant speed prop is you want to set the, uh, the prop first, then the throttle. So you want the prop to be at maximum, bring the throttle up. If you want to reduce the engine power, you'll pull the prop back, then the RPM. What you don't want to get is high manifold pressure and low RPM. If you think about it, there's a lot of pressure in the engine, but it's not turning very much. So it's, it's putting stress on the engine. So typically the RPM, uh, which measures the prop speed, and the uh, manifold pressure, which measures how the engine is performing based on the throttle, should be roughly the same. So typically on full power takeoff, you'd uh, run the engine up to about 25 inches and about 2,500 RPM. As you get to cruise, you might pull the uh, engine power back to say 23 inches and then set the prop for about 2,300 RPM. So there's a fairly close uh, relationship between number of inches and number of hundreds of RPM. So you see 2,500 RPM, 25 inches. 20 inches, 2,000 RPM, or 20 hundreds. So um, here you can see bringing the prop, uh, the throttle up, you get the RPM going up and the manifold pressure going up. In this case, the manifold pressure is higher because it's, we're on takeoff. Now, as you get into uh, operating the uh, aircraft and you want to set the prop, as the prop is changed, you're going to get a change. What will happen is um, the angle of the blade, uh, which is controlled in most cases by hydraulic pressure with the oil system, hydraulic, uh, keeping it in a certain position, uh, it will it will seek its own level. It will find its best, most uh, efficient angle of attack. Because you think about it, this is uh, a prop is basically a small wing. It's an airfoil, and it meets the air at an angle of attack, just like a wing does. So in this case, the difference between uh, perpendicular and the pitch of the blade. Okay, right here is the pitch of the blade, but the difference between the uh, cord of the blade and the angle there is the angle of attack. Just like on an aircraft, um, the blade has a, uh, what's called an angle of incidence or an angle of attack. So anyway, as the, uh, as the pitch moves up, this becomes more coarse. If it moves down, it's more fine. Now, as it keeps going, I'll let it run here for a moment. All right. It will keep increasing, and ultimately, if you allow the pitch to get, so here we, we've now reached cruise speed. So this is the most efficient angle for cruise speed because you're moving faster through the air, so the propeller needs to take a bigger bite out of the air to maintain the same amount of thrust. As you come in for, uh, let's see here if we can get it to, uh, get towards, okay, here it is. So now we're coming into, say, landing. All right, let's get this again. And you pull the throttle back. The RPM is needs to be faster, so the angle will come back down a little bit. Let me get back there and freeze that so you can see it. Okay, as it goes there, all right. As, as the throttle is pulled back, the pitch of the propeller will begin to go towards fine to maintain the same RPM. So if you notice that the 
uh, the RPM is declining, and so is the manifold pressure. And the manifold pressure is now at about 15 inches, and the RPM is a little above it, about 1650. So again, the, the RPM is above the manifold pressure. Now, when you come in for landing, you want the RPM to be almost as far forward as possible so the, the, uh, the prop will be turning as fast as it can to get the maximum thrust out of whatever uh, engine setting you've got. Now, I think this will also show the uh, feathered position. So when you reach a point where, now, you typically only see these in high-performance aircraft, um, particularly twins, uh, because if you lose a, uh, an engine in a twin, that propeller not only forms a, if you think about it, a flat plate into the wind. Whoops, I would not want that to go again. Stop it. Okay, stop it. Okay, this is feathered. You can see this angle is more in fine pitch. If, if the propeller is not turning, it's sitting here just taking the wind full frontal. What will happen, though, is because there's a slight incidence there, it's not generally going to stand still. It's going to windmill very slowly, which just increases the drag that much more. So on a twin, if you've got one side uh, where the engine's not running and the, um, the prop is windmilling, it's, consider it's creating a considerable amount of drag and adverse yaw. And if you increase the power on the good engine, uh, because when, as you know, when you create, uh, when you when you add thrust to an engine or you add throttle to an engine and it increases thrust, the, the airflow from the prop, the slipstream going over the wing creates additional lift. And the lift created by that functioning propeller will cause the wing on the good side to lift and you have drag on the non-functioning side, which is less lift, and the airplane will want to roll over on its back. So it's it's very important to try and minimize the drag on a non-functioning engine on a twin. And you do this by putting the air the the uh, propeller into feather position. That's note shown here by this knob where you pull it all the way back. When you pull the prop control all the way back, the propeller creates the smallest angle of attack possible. It gets almost zero lift. So this minimizes the drag. Uh, and allows for less adverse yaw and less drag. In a single engine aircraft, you have no engine, you're going down, but with less drag, you can extend the glide of the airplane uh, much longer and might be able to make it to either a field or an airport, uh, but you don't, it, it will extend the, um, the glide radius of the aircraft. So anyway, that's a little bit, and you don't really need to know uh, all the mechanics of how a, a constant speed prop works with counterweights and the springs and the hydraulics. It's a fairly uh, complex mechanism, um, but an interesting one. If you ever have an aircraft like this, uh, there are certain pre-flight uh, items that have to be taken into account, uh, such as running the prop control through its full range several times to pump oil through the hub and make sure that it's functioning properly. And you can get the... Uh, um, blade into feather and out. Um, one thing that some aircraft do, particularly twin engines, if you ever try to start the engine with the prop feathered, as you can see, this flat plate is now turning this way <laughs> and it creates a considerable amount of drag. It could be very, very difficult to start the engine with the propeller in the feathered position. But the problem is, how do you get it unfeathered <laughs> with no uh, oil being pumped through it? There are some aircraft that have what's called an unfeathering accumulator, which is a reservoir that will allow you to get the prop unfeathered enough to get the engine started. But again, that's something you see on much more higher performance aircraft. So anyway, that's the basic uh, function of a constant speed prop. The reason we use constant speed props as opposed to fixed pitch, uh, they're more expensive, uh, they're more complicated, they require more maintenance, they are heavier, so why use them? Uh, because they're more efficient, because it allows you to tailor the uh, function of the airfoil in the prop, which is like tailoring the airfoil in your wing, to its most efficient configuration depending on the flight regime that you're in. 
Uh, a fixed pitch prop is a compromise of the best uh, climb and cruise that you can get averaging the two. If you fly a lot of cross country, you might opt for a more cruise centered prop. If you fly a lot out of very short fields or you fly back country, you might want a climb prop uh, to give you better short field performance. Um, there are also uh, props that can be adjusted on the ground to suit one or the other, depending as your conditions occur. But the purpose of a constant speed prop is it's constantly, as it says, constant, uh, constantly adjusting itself for the most efficient uh, configuration for the flight regime. So that's why we put up with constant speed props and all of their uh, myriad problems, such as leaking hubs and uh, other, other issues to work with, uh, the complexity of the mechanism. Uh, there's a lot to it, and there's more things to inspect, and therefore it's more expensive. Um, but on a faster aircraft, they make a world of difference. And once you've uh, flown with one, it's uh, really quite enjoyable to do so. All right, so that's uh, a little bit about constant speed props. Uh, Get back to our regular thing here. Now, um, I wanted to talk a little bit, while well, we still have a little time left, about, um, I talked some last time about uh, oil systems and a little bit about oil. Um, of course, everybody checks the oil, I hope, before every flight. Um, that's uh, one thing that will destroy an engine pretty quick is lack of oil or lack of sufficient oil pressure. Um, you'll see various kinds of oil as an operator, owner operator, uh, you'll see different kinds of oil, mineral oil, ashless, ashless dispersant oil, uh, different types that have different functions. Um, generally speaking, um, uh, I think it's uh, the mineral oil is used, um, I, I, it's been a while since I've studied this, but there's one that you. Well, your screen sharing here. Oh, so oh sure. So you're back on camera. Gotcha, gotcha. Let me take that off. All right, uh, take the screen share off. There we go. All right, let's see if we can get back here. Um, there is a uh, generally new engine manufacturer just using a particular type of oil for the first uh, 25 hours to break it in. And after that, using uh, different types. So whatever uh, oil the, in the engine manufacturer recommends is the one you should use. Uh, there are various varieties, and they, they all have different functions in terms of what they do. Um, the one thing I, I talked a little bit about yesterday, or excuse me, Sunday, was uh, the oil analysis program. And the reason this is a very useful diagnostic tool for the mechanic, uh, if you're an owner that has an expensive engine, then, you know, some of the... Uh, high-end engines, a TSI 0540, you know, you're looking north of 50 grand for a new engine and probably 20 or more for an overhaul. Uh, you want that engine to last. You don't want it to, to wear out prematurely. And I think I mentioned that one of the things is uh, anytime metal is rubbing against metal, it's going to create friction and there's going to be some, um, some wear uh, and you're going to see little particulate, you may not even see it, it may be so small you can't see it, but there will be uh, small particles of different types of metal in the oil, and that's just part of the way that um, metallic surfaces wear when, they, when they're rubbing together. Oil uh, functions not only to lubricate and cushion and seal, but also to cool the engine, but one of the things it does is clearly is uh, reduce friction. Um, but what you can find as a mechanic, or if you take a sample of oil uh, on a regular basis and you send it off for analysis, they'll what they do is they put it into a, a laboratory device and they burn it and they shine light, uh, various kinds of light through it and they can get a spectrum uh, depending on what elements are present in the oil. Uh, you could find anything from iron, copper, chromium, aluminum, nickel, tin, any different kinds of uh, metals. What these can tell you is, are any particular parts of the engine wearing uh, more rapidly than others? Are you having a problem that's incipient, about to become a bigger problem, uh, and you need to take a look at it? Uh, examples could be that if you see iron, uh, you may be seeing premature wear in the piston rings. If you're seeing uh, an increase in aluminum, you could be having problems with the pistons. 
uh, if it's copper, um, the bearings might be starting to wear. Uh, if you see bronze, uh, valve seats are typically made out of, that's the, um, because the valves are slamming into the engine back and forth as they open and close rapidly. Uh, they'll rapidly wear out the surface that they, they hit. So the seat where the valve connects into or, or, or stops on the crankcase, they'll make a valve seat, typically of bronze. So if you're seeing excessive bronze in the oil, uh, that could indicate that the valve seats are wearing. So a good mechanic can see these spikes on an oil analysis report and determine that you may have uh, a particular problem and it can all, often be isolated to a particular engine, uh, excuse me, a particular cylinder. If you have an engine analyzer which will show cylinder head temperatures for various cylinders, if you start to see one cylinder running hotter than usual or colder than usual, uh, you might uh, be able to isolate uh, not only what valve or what particular item is uh, being aware, but what cylinder it's in. So you could only take off the one cylinder that you'd have to to, to diagnose the problem and not do a complete overhaul. So, um, so oil, like I said, everybody thinks, oh, yes, we have to have oil to run the engine, but it's uh, a considerably uh, more sophisticated than most people give it credit for. It's not just uh, keeping stuff from, from rubbing and wearing out. It's actually, it, it performs a diagnostic function as well. So, uh, uh, and of course, uh, we have um, oil pump, oil pressure, oil temperature readings, uh, all of which need to be monitored uh, during the flight uh, progress. Uh, most aircraft require a warm-up period. Uh, one of the reasons that you warm up the engine brand is to get the oil uh, thin enough so that it will move through the engine in an efficient way. It won't be because you know, when, when oil gets cold, it gets thicker. It's the viscosity goes up. Uh, so when we typically start up the engine and let it idle, we're looking for a certain uh, temperature on the oil, or at least some reading to go up the oil temperature gauge to know that the, the oil is starting to circulate. Um, I flew a Mooney for a lot of years, and you wouldn't see the oil pressure begin to come up until the oil heated up. So you'd see the oil temperature come up before you'd see the oil pressure come up. Um, and then you wouldn't really taxi off the ramp until you got readings on both of them. So uh, it's not just checking whether you've got enough in there, but it's also kind of keeping an eye on it in flight to see, make sure that you're not uh, getting high oil temps or high oil pressures, because um, those are obviously serious things that need to be attended to immediately, uh, or you could have a, an in-flight uh, catastrophic failure of the engine. So anyway, that's, that covers a little bit about uh, oil and uh, variable pitch props, carburetor, carburetor icing, uh, a little more detail from what we would, uh, discussed on Sunday. Uh, any particular questions uh, on some of the stuff I went over or from last time? I think we've got, we don't have any questions in the, in the Q&A, um, but, uh, but this has been really thorough, George, um, and it's, it's been fantastic having this level of detail. We haven't gone this deep really before, uh, so I think this is going to be a really solid well, I said, you know, I tried to avoid uh, giving a mechanics lecture like I would give at an A&P uh, class, but I found as a pilot when I was an A&P student, uh, I approached the study of the material a little differently than other people who were not pilots because I knew what some of this uh, material meant in an operational uh, scenario. Um, mm -hmm. For them, they were just looking at getting the answers right on the, on the exam, but I was thinking, well, what's the difference between uh, operating on the lean side of peak uh, at cruise rather than the rich side of peak at cruise? And uh, so some of these things as a pilot uh, were more important to me than they were to some other people. Right. So uh, I think to the extent that you probably are not going to get anywhere near this level of detail in an oral exam uh, for your private certificate, but I think, uh, for example, I think the um, the question of uh, rich versus uh, lean and peak operation is something you could actually discuss with uh, an examiner, and uh, it could show that you have thought about the material in a little more depth than just the basic 
superficial book knowledge because you're thinking long term. What's this going to mean for me as a pilot when I'm operating the airplane? Uh, I'm not just going to push the throttle forward and keep the, the mixture all the way in and, and just you know run it to death. I'm actually going to think about what the engine is doing. So uh, for an examiner, that would tend to suggest that you're a more thoughtful uh, manager of your systems, which means that you're a more careful pilot. I think that there's a certain perception that comes from uh, having at least a little bit of knowledge uh, about how these systems work. Uh, the other thing is knowing the fact that the magnetos are going to keep the spark going as long as the prop is turning and the engine's turning. Uh, if you start to see your uh, uh, your electrical system starting to die on you, uh, you know that at least the airplane will fly. Um, I have had one time where I actually did have an electrical problem flying on an instrument flight back from uh, South Georgia, and it was starting to affect the radios. It was uh, I was not getting enough current flow. I ended up turning off every light except the um, rotating beacon the strobe. Uh, I turned off the second radio. I turned off the GPS and started. It was it was not instrument conditions. It was uh, a night flight, but I was able to navigate by roads. I turned off literally everything that was electrical that could be turned off that didn't require um, contact with ATC. Uh, radio one, um, the uh, uh, the electric fuel pump, the uh, uh, the transponder, everything else had turned off. So I shed as much of the load as I could and watched the amateur, uh, you know, until I got back. And I managed to, I actually lost the radio on final approach to the airport, but I'd already been cleared. And it turned out to be not a, a battery problem, not an, amp, uh, uh, an alternator problem. It was an electrical uh, glitch somewhere in the wiring that they ultimately tracked down. But... Um, I knew that the airplane would fly. I just didn't want to be caught where I couldn't talk to air traffic control or they would lose track of me. Or, because I didn't want to land at night. Um, so I saved, uh, you know, I, I had actually made practice landings at night without the um, landing light. So fortunately I didn't have to do that. But but knowing the fact that, uh, oh my God, the battery is dying. My electrical system's going. Well, because I knew that magnetos are gonna keep the spark going. I wasn't worried about the engine quitting. Uh, so having that level of knowledge as a pilot uh, can give you a little bit of comfort when you may face a, you know, an emergency situation. Uh, so anyway, I'm, uh, I've been uh, pleased to contribute to this. I hope it was useful, and uh, I hope to contribute again in the future. If you'll uh, get in touch with me, I'll see how my schedule works. I'm uh, currently, in fact, I'm going to be going to bed soon because I get up at uh, – 4.15 Eastern time, which is about 1 o'clock your time. Um, and depending on how my shift bid goes, I may end up on a different shift, and I don't know what my availability will be, but uh, I do hope you'll stay in touch with me. I would like to uh, contribute again if I could. Um, and if I can improve this in any way, I think with some more graphics perhaps, or uh, perhaps if people come with some prepared questions, I would certainly be um, able to answer those in advance. Hey, George, George yes. Mark, can I ask you? I'll follow, up, I'll follow up with you. I'll give you a call right after we're done. Uh, okay. And, uh, and yeah, I think we're good. We're, like, pretty much dead on the hour here. Uh, yeah. So so thanks to everyone who came, and um, hopefully we'll see you guys on Sunday. George, Have a good can evening, I ask Mark. You? See you later, Keith. George, could I ask you a quick question here? Oh, yes, sir. Yes. Something I came across today I'd never heard before, and it it – involves flying in cold weather and they're recommending checking the heater as part of your before takeoff check and their reasoning is that the gyros use cabin air and which I'm not sure is true because my vacuum pump used to suck it out of the engine compartment not out of the cabin but they're saying that if you don't have your heater set right that the gyros will run sluggishly in cold air, and I had never heard that before. Does that sound in any way reasonable? Well, uh, I guess it's possible. I mean, I've not heard that either. But if you're flying at, uh, you know, in the winter at a considerable altitude, it can be well below zero uh, ambient temperature outside. And I guess it depends on where that instrument is with respect to the firewall uh, and, where, and where does the system draw the air from. Um, 
Because isn't the vacuum pump in the engine bowl ahead of the firewall? Uh, well, I think what they may be talking about is uh, not so much the vacuum pump itself, but you know that the vacuum pump draws air from the instrument itself. So, you know, that, in other words, it produces right, right, vacuum, right. And, it, and then the, the instrument is in the cockpit. So uh, what they may be talking about is not so much the temperature of the air, but the temperature of the instrument itself may bind the veins that are because turning. Because it's on the back side of the firewall in the cabin. Right, because it's not in the on the engine side of the fire the firewall. Uh, if you've ever seen the inside of a, uh, a vein driven uh, vacuum instrument, they're, right. they're very right. fragile, really, right. because they're operating you know at very high speeds, and. Uh, I would think it's possible for those to bind up if they're um, if they're too cold. Uh, I know if you ever noticed that uh, in wintertime it takes a while for the um, the uh, attitude indicator to erect spin sure, time to sure. spin up. Uh, and I think it's just because it's like everything else has been sitting cold soaked for a while out of the ramp. Uh, but as far as the air, uh, I that's not I'm not sure that uh, that's something I've ever heard. Okay. Uh, the, the way, I, I, mean, I had it either, and I, thought, I just wanted to ask somebody. Well, and I think, and I think it might be this because you know that there's two kinds of pumps. There's the vacuum pumps, and then there's the pressure pumps. The ones that blow and the ones that right. draw. Right. And if they blow, if they're blowing air, uh, that would be coming from the engine compartment, so they should be heated. But if they're drawing air, well, the air has to go, you know, into the instrument somewhere, so it can be drawn out the other side. I mean. Right. The, engine's, the, the instrument is not sealed because if you drew on it, it would eventually stop drawing at all. So the ha what it is, it's a regulated amount of air that allows it, uh, if the, the pump is sucking air out of uh, a larger orifice on the back of the instrument, there has to be a regulated orifice somewhere else on the instrument for the air to come in to create a vacuum. It, it would just stop, right. stop drawing. So if the air is coming in, uh, on the regulated side from where it's really cold. Also, if it happens to be humid, you know, it could ice up. <laughs> um, but I don't know that necessarily the, the coldness and the density of the air, that's a new one on me. I haven't heard that before. Okay. Uh, I'd like to maybe look that up too. That, that's interesting. Thank you. I appreciate your, con your contributions and uh, very interesting talk. Sure, sure. It's been my pleasure and I look forward to working with you all again. Thank you. Oh, Thank you I'll give you a call. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you very much. It's cooler. Now you add to that the evaporation of the liquid, and when a liquid evaporates, what it's doing is it's changing its its state from a liquid to a vapor. Or think about this: when um, when ice melts. Uh, it's basically uh, giving up what heat it has into uh, the environment. So whenever it changes state, uh, you know, for example, when, when a liquid evaporates, it's going to uh, become less dense, and therefore it's going to become cooler. Uh, mainly, if you it's, it's at a molecular level, as the molecules are farther and farther apart because they're not as dense, because the pressure's lower. Uh, they're not banging around as much, and they're not generating as much internal friction and heat. So it's, it's two things. It's the reduction of pressure of the airflow through the throat of the um, carburetor and the evaporation of the fluid, which is the fuel, when it becomes vaporized going into uh, the airflow here. So it's both of them really contribute to that. And if you have ambient conditions, which are cooler than normal, then you're just getting that much closer to the conditions that will allow carburetor icing to occur. Yeah, I guess it just surprises me that the density decreases when you add vapor. I would think that the density would increase. Well, well, the density uh, is, I'm speaking of these two as two separate things. The density decreases because of the speeding up of the airflow. Yeah. The, va the vaporization of the fuel is a separate thing. Yeah. It, the density will will increase slightly because you're putting something in it, which is the um, the vapor. But the temperature drop for the vapor and the temperature drop for the increase of the airflow is considerably more than the increase in temperature you get because you're slightly making the uh, the airflow denser by injecting something into it. 
uh, the amount of uh, density that's increased by putting a little bit of vapor into it uh, is more than overcome by the drop in temperature because of the uh, decrease in pressure and the evaporation of the uh, fuel. So does that mean that carburetor icing is at higher risk when the air is moving faster and therefore when the throttle is wide open? Uh, it, that's the biggest pressure well, difference. Well, well, it's not so much a faster. What it is is the um, the speed is determined. The speed of the airflow through the engine is determined by the shape and the size of the throat of the venturi. The amount of the air that gets through is is uh, determined by the the throttle plate here. So it's okay. going to go through at the same speed. It's just not as much as going to go through. So so the design of this uh, it's like the design of a wing determines uh, how much air goes over the top or below it and, and how fast the air goes over the top or below it because of the shape of the airfoil. That's a fixed thing. The airfoil is what it is. This is like two air, this, in a way, if you think about it, this is like um, old-timey biplanes that had constriction between the two wings before they figured out that actually was okay. better to put the curve on the top of it. This is, this is like two wings right here. So, okay. so, okay, okay. so this doesn't change. So basically, as you adjust the throttle, the air intake. Also right. It it, it 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 determines the volume the volume of the air that goes into the indu induction system. Uh, right. The induction system, which comes right out of here. So basically, the volume of the fuel air mixture and the the quantity of the fuel air mixture is determined by this is this right here is basically is connected to the mixture control. It determines how much fuel gets into this. Um, nozzle. Uh, in other words, so the amount of fuel that goes into the airstream is controlled by the mixture. Uh, if you pull the mixture uh, all the way out and or push it, whichever how is it, however this is connected. Uh, but if you maximize the amount of fuel going into the airflow, you have the maximum richness. If you restrict this amount of fluid or fuel going in here, you'll get a leaner mixture. So the Air comes through here and the fuel is added to it and the ratio between the two is controlled not by the air because the air comes in at the rate that the air comes in. It's the amount of fuel you add to it. That's why your mixture control controls fuel. Your throttle controls how much of that mix actually gets into the engine. Less gets in, it's going to produce less power. If more gets in, it will produce more power. So, so that's the basics of carburetor icing. Now, one other uh, fact that carburetors have uh, a problem with it. You know, uh, most people have never seen this because they haven't driven a carbureted car unless you drive an old vintage car or a muscle car uh, is vapor lock. And what vapor lock is, is if you have, uh, if the engine gets hot enough, uh, and particularly the, um, the carburetor itself, uh, the fuel can actually get so hot that it will start to evaporate before it gets into the fuel nozzle. And if you get a bubble uh, in the line, describe uh, when you have problems. What regime of the flight are you in? Are you, are you noticing problems on climb, or when the engine's at idle, or when you're running at full power, or in cruise speed? Uh, what is the RPM? Uh, what was your mixture setting? If you can give the mechanic uh, this kind of information, that helps them to diagnose what the problem is. Is it a valve problem? Is it uh, possibly uh, the rings are worn and you're getting uh, an incomplete seal? Are the spark plugs um, uh, fouled? Um, so there are any number of things that could be a cause of loss of power that the mechanic can diagnose depending on the symptoms. It's very much like a doctor. If you can describe the symptoms, uh, when does it hurt? Well, when, you're, when you move your arm, where does it hurt? Okay, that kind of thing. So, uh, so knowing a little bit about how the engine works, as uh, like so, you're not going to be a mechanic facing it yourself, but you can you can describe to a mechanic uh, anytime you have a problem, you think the engine is not producing full power. Um, so I want to take a moment and look here at uh, we talked a little bit about yesterday about um, carburetors, uh, since most of uh, training aircraft have carburation instead of um, uh, fuel injection. We'll look at a little carburation video here. And this is actually a very simplified view, but it's very good because it shows some aspects of what a carbur what most carburetors look like. This is um, 
an updraft carburetor, so it's bolted onto the engine at the top of the carburetor. Uh, air is drawn in through the intake and up through the carburetor. They can be downdraft, but most of these are bolted on at the bottom of the engine, so they'd be updraft carburetors. Fuel uh, is drawn either by gravity, say from a high-winged aircraft like a Cessna Skyhawk or 152, gravity, assisted by a pump if necessary, will uh, put fuel into the bowl of the carburetor or the float chamber. There's a float in there uh, which allows, which keeps the uh, fuel at a certain level. Um, if you're in a low-wing aircraft, uh, the fuel tank is typically at the level or below uh, the carburetor. So obviously <laughs> fuel doesn't flow uphill. It has to get there uh, under pressure of a, um, an engine driven or electric fuel pump. So here we, what we've got here is uh, to give you just a quick overview of what the parts are and how this will relate to carburetor icing, which is a, a problem that's endemic to, uh, to flow carburetors, is fuel is drawn in to this float chamber, which controls the level, which as you'll notice is about the same level here. This is called, uh, this is, well, I'll let, let it run, you can see. This is the venturi of the carburetor. Uh, so air comes in and the discharge nozzle here is where fuel is uh, squirted basically into the airstream that will then go into, air will come out of the carburetor into the intake manifold and it will be split into four or six or however many uh, cylinders uh, are being fed with the fuel air mixture. So you have fuel coming into the flow chamber. The float controls the level of the fuel. The fuel will come into this discharge nozzle. Air will enter through here. Now, you notice the shape of this, which is, uh, which as you might notice, looks something like an airfoil. Uh, it's called a venturi, and just like an airfoil, it creates an area of low pressure because the air flowing through here, uh, if you remember Bernoulli's principle from uh, your study of airframe and aerodynamics, if you've gotten to those lessons yet, what makes a wing lift is the air going over the curved surface on the top of the wing has to travel faster. And when you increase the flow of a fluid, whether it's liquid or air, you reduce the pressure. So what happens is when the air flows into this venturi, by flowing through the constriction, it speeds up. When it speeds up, the pressure drops. When the pressure drops, that essentially creates a pressure differential from the ambient to that in the engine. So there's a the air will want to go this way, and it will take this fuel into the intake manifold. Now the fuel is basically squirted out of this into little droplets, where and it's vaporized, so it becomes a vapor, not a liquid. So the vapor will combine with the air coming in through the um, air intake of the of the engine. It will mix here. And this little flapper here, this but this is a butterfly valve. This is controlled by the throttle. Um, when it's mostly vertical, the throttle is wide open. When it is closed or more uh, horizontal, that's when the engine's at idle and less air is getting around it. See if I can run it forward a little bit and you can see how that opens and closes. When it's um, open, you get more airflow through, therefore more power. When it closes, you get more, um, you get less air going through and therefore it's an idle. Now, uh, the question becomes, well, how does carburetor icing occur, particularly uh, in the summertime? Uh, you can actually get carburetor icing at temperature. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, Happy to be here again doing uh, Aircraft Systems 2. I uh, thought that what I would like to do is maybe discuss a little bit more detail of uh, some of the items that we discussed the other night. Uh, let me see what I've got going on here. Yeah, that happens. Yeah, it's just like a recursive thing. If you just switch to one of your other tabs, you'll be fine. Let's do that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> is that better? Perfect. Uh, much better, much better. Good. I'm getting a little echo, but that's not bad. Okay. So, anyway, we talked a little bit the other night about um, how reciprocating engines work, and I thought uh, it'd be good to show a graphic. And I finally found one that I think is very good. And this is actually um, an interesting little.
I seem to have lost the audio, guys. Is that me or Mark? Can you? Uh... I muted you, Mark, uh, so I can't hear you. But I think I George, you might have lost your audio. I lost George too. The turn. So if you have at any one point in time. Hey, one George. Cylinder, here. Yes. I'm sorry, you broke up for a while there, but it sounds like I think you're back. Could you could you start again? Sorry. Oh, certainly. Um, what this shows is a graphic representation of a cylinder in the engine, as if you in the uh, the confines of the engine, the, the cylinder being transparent. Um, what this is useful for is seeing what each cylinder is doing at each moment of the four cycles. Now, I've frozen it right here. So what you can see basically is, um, in this case, uh, and I'll just call this cylinder one, this two, this three, and this four. Uh, cylinder one here has the fuel air mixture in it, and it will begin on the upstroke of the cylinder to begin compressing it. This one has just fired and will be going down. As this one, which is paired with it, goes down, it will be drawing uh, fuel air mixture into it. And as this one goes up, it will be exhausting the, uh, the burn gases. So at any one time, you have uh, one cylinder firing, and as it goes down, the, another cylinder, not necessarily the one next to it, but another cylinder, is also on the downstroke, and it is uh, drawing intake air in. The other two are going in the other direction, one to um, compress the fuel air mixture, the other to exhaust the burn mixture. So as you'll notice, it, the aircraft will, will, well, the engine will uh, alternate between different cylinders. And the order, the firing order, is determined by the configuration of the engine, the number of cylinders, whether it's uh, inline or horizontally opposed, um, and the particular manufacturer. For example, the way the cylinders are numbered between um, Lycoming and Continental are different. I don't recall which one it is, but one numbers them from front to back, the other from back to front, meaning firewall forward or prop backwards. Uh, in terms of what the numbers are. They would be one, three, two, four, or one, three, two, four. That's not the order that they fire in necessarily. They're just given the numbers for, for use in terms of determining which cylinder you're talking about. But what you'll have is the firing order is determined by what position the, uh, the piston is in its orientation on the crankshaft. So this is the crankshaft right here. In this case, it's driving a belt, but it could be, as in most general aviation aircraft, directly connected to the prop. The prop is actually bolted uh, to a flange at the forward end of the crankshaft. So as the crankshaft turns, it turns the prop at the same RPM that the engine is turning. Uh, there are certain types of aircraft that have a gearing system or a prop speed reduction unit, which is a little more complex uh, set of gearing. Um, for example, um, uh, King Airs, which use a turbo prop, a turbine engine, jet turbine engine, have the uh, the, R the engine RPM geared down significantly to get it to about 1,800 RPM at the prop. But the engine's turning it considerably faster. So there's a considerably um, complex uh, gearing mechanism to gear the prop down. But most uh, aircraft engines are are bolted directly to the uh, crankshaft. So. Engine turns at 2,300 RPM, the prop is turning at 2,300 RPM. So in this case, just kind of ignore the belt. You can, uh, in this case, the belt is turning the camshafts. Uh, this is a double overhead cam because you've got one, two. And what the cams do is time the valves here and here for each piston, intake and exhaust, uh, to move up and down as they need be in the cycle of allowing fuel air mixture in, or exhaust gases out. So in this case, you notice uh, each one of the cylinders is at some point in the four cycles, and they're all different. So if we watch it a little bit, you'll see that 
the firing order is changing from, in this case, let's see, I'll call it one, three, four, two. One, three, four, two. So they're not firing in the necessarily the order of the number of the cylinders. They're firing in the order of how the engine is designed to generate power onto the crankshaft. Now, if you'll notice that the crankshaft is, there's a, the shaft is basically in line with the prop. I'm calling this the prop over here. So the crankshaft is right here, but the, uh, to get the shaft to turn, the pistons have to be connected to it off center. Uh, these are connecting rods, which connect the piston right here to the crankshaft. These are called journals, and they are offset um, uh, items that the, uh, the connecting rod will be attached to. Uh, so when the piston drives down, it pushes the connecting rod against the journal, which causes this to, if you just, let's say, focus on this one right here. Notice how it will reciprocate. It will go back and forth. The piston will go up and down, and the crankshaft will go around. So basically what a reciprocating engine does is it converts linear motion up and down to the piston to rotational motion, which is the turning of the prop, which is basically the function of a reciprocating engine. So if you watch this one, you notice how it is turning as the, whoops, let me try that again. See if we can restart that. All right. All right, I think I broke the internet. Give me a moment here as it reloads. Okay, here we go. So if you notice, as the uh, uh, piston is going up and down, it's, it's rotating around. That's this uh, reciprocating action that drives the crankshaft in a circular motion. So if you also notice, you can sort of see a little bit of these valves opening up as the lobes on the camshaft, which are oblong. As they rotate, they will push the valves down to open them and allow them to close. So what the valves do is allow the fuel-air mixture in and the burned exhaust gases out. Now, the timing of when the valves open and close is, again, structured by the designer. Now, you'll hear the term sometimes, um, uh, and you, you don't really need to know the, the entire engineering of how the aircraft is set, but you hear before top dead center or after top dead center. All that means is the, uh, the firing actually occurs before the piston gets to the top of its travel. It's actually firing while it's still compressing. And as it completely burns, it's driving down in the other direction. Uh, so the valves will open at different times to allow air in and uh, exhaust gases out. What was interesting to me when I first learned this is that uh, sometimes the valves are both open, sometimes they're both closed, sometimes one is open, and sometimes the other is open. Uh, so there are times when both are open and fuel air mixture is coming in and exhaust gas is going out and the incoming mixture is helping scavenger clean the, uh, the piston out, uh, the, uh, the cylinder out. So uh, valve timing is what mechanics do to set to make sure that the engine is functioning properly. Now, uh, sometimes you'll hear in your car, uh, particularly older cars, you'll hear uh, a ticking sound, which is not detonation or knocking, but it's a, it's a sub more subtle ticking. Uh, it's, it's called a uh, valve knock or valve clicking. Uh, and what that is, is the, uh, in most uh, general aviation engines, the valves are what are called, uh, they're run on hydraulic lifters. That is, there's a, an amount of oil pressure that holds the, uh, the valve um, open, and then the, uh, the camshaft will drive it closed and then allow it to open up, or they can be spring-loaded. If those springs wear out, or if the hydraulic lifters start to leak, sometimes the valves will not open and close at the appropriate times. You'll get incomplete burning. You'll get uh, reduced power. Um, so when you talk to a mechanic, if you're having difficulties with uh, your engine, let's say it's a rental engine or it's your own aircraft engine, um, being able to just, there's over 90 degrees ambient, which astonishes most people because you think, well, uh, Water freezes at 32 degrees, so why, is, why am I getting ice on a summer day? 
Well, what happens is when you have uh, this venturi here decreasing the pressure, it also decreases the temperature. And when liquid fuel is sprayed into this throat here, and you have the uh, uh, lower pressure and lower temperature, and it's vaporized, uh, the air temperature in this throat here can drop as much as 70 degrees uh, because when you uh, evaporate fuel, it sheds heat, so it becomes colder. So what happens is uh, when the air is cooling and speeding up and you inject this uh, vapor into it and it evaporates, uh, that loss of temperature can be significant enough to cause uh, carburetor icing or start frost to form. And if I'll run it forward a little bit, you'll see a little bit about how it'll start to form. Uh, it'll start to build up on the walls of the venturi here in the throat because that's constricted. It'll also start to build up on the plates of the uh, butterfly valve, and particularly when it's closed or near idle. Let's see here. It should start here. So here's what it'll look like. It'll start to build here in the throat, and it'll start to build up on the uh, the butterfly valve. So if you think about that, now you've got reduced space. You've got even more reduced airflow. Therefore, you've got even less power. And if you have less power, then, of course, it's going to get worse and worse. Now, the way this, to stop or reverse this is this... Um, you get some heating uh, just from contact with the engine, but not enough to melt this ice. So what happens is uh, heat can be directed to the carburetor through the use of carburetor ice, carburetor heat. And what that does, when you pull the carburetor heat knob out, it directs airflow from a muff or a container around the um, uh, exhaust pipe, which, is, which also serves to heat the aircraft, uh, which is where you get your heat if, in the, the wintertime. Uh, even if you fly in the summertime, uh, you fly high enough, uh, it's going to get pretty chilly in the uh, aircraft. That's why small aircraft don't have air conditioning, but they do have heat. Uh, so the same heating system that will heat the, uh, the uh, interior of the aircraft will also heat around, there's a box around this uh, carburetor, which will heat it up. And it, uh, it's a very efficient uh, method of heating. You'll actually uh, heat this fairly quickly, melt this ice, uh, if there's enough ice in here and it melts to water, uh, that slug of water can actually get into the engine and cause it to stumble a little bit. But once that's clear, you should be able to um, have full power again. So anyway, this is this is what carburetor icing looks like. Uh, and it can come on very quickly, and it can dissipate very quickly as well. So for uh, those who fly um, carburetor engines, that's something you always have to be uh, aware of and uh, uh, careful of, even in the summertime. So uh, the key is to follow the manufacturer's, the pilot's operating handbook, uh, the manufacturer's recommendations for when you should and should not use carburetor heat. You typically don't use it on takeoff because when you heat air, it of course becomes uh, less dense. And if you have less dense air, you're going to reduce the amount of power that the engine will output. So uh, typically carburetor heat is not used on takeoff. Uh, however, on landing, since the uh, engine is often at idle and you have the risk of developing uh, carburetor icing in these areas, uh, most aircraft uh, manufacturers such as Cessna, if I, I, I've flown Skyhawks fairly regularly and I believe that the uh, carburetor heat is a checklist item for uh, before landing. So anyway, anybody have any questions about um, uh, carburetor icing or how that occurs? Can you explain very quickly one more time exactly why it is that the air cools? Is it simply just the, the introduction of vapor that somehow removes the heat from the air? No, it's both. Uh, it's basically, it's a matter of physics. Um, if you've ever uh, done any kind of uh, uh, work with, uh, say, air compressors, when you compress air into a cylinder, it, the, it'll get warm because you compress, you're, you're pushing the molecules closer together. When you release the air, uh, like if you have a, uh, an air nozzle on the end of your home air compressor, if you ever you know, squirt the air on your skin, it feels very cold. Because what happens is uh, it's just a matter of physics. When a gas goes from a higher pressure to a lower pressure, it gives up heat. It becomes cooler. 
So that is just that's just uh, physics. It has nothing to do with uh, airplanes in particular or engines in particular. It's just um, it's uh, physics 101. It's one of those things that uh, higher pressure air is hotter, uh, lower pressure air, or as it as it lowers in pressure, it 